you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Welcome back to Mysteries and Monsters. This week, we take a trip to the southeast of the United States to uncover some of the cryptids and legends of the Peach State, otherwise known as Georgia, in the company of David Weatherly. David takes us on a tour of some of the state's most notable cases over the years as we go on the hunt for all kinds of monsters. From the terrifying Hogzilla and how it came to prominence, to one of my favourite water-based cryptids, Alti, who inhabits the river on the banks of Darien. We also look at two contrasting facets of Bigfoot, from the infamous hoax body furore of 2008 to the intriguing Elkins Creek flap of the mid-1990s, as well as looking at the strange case of the werewolf of Talbot County, amongst others. As always, before that though, you can support the show by signing up for Patreon by going to patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters, or you can click on the link in the show notes for $4 a month. That'll get you early access, ad-free episodes, and bonus content. Mysteries and Monsters is also across all social media platforms. Facebook, or Meta, or wherever they call it these days. Instagram, Twitter, and you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also find the mysteriesandmonsters.com website, with updates, news, and merchandise. As always, a big thank you to Dean Bestall for his wonderful artwork, Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys for his producing duties, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, let's head down into Georgia, in the company of the marvellous David Weatherly. On this week's Mysteries and Monsters, it's a warm and overdue welcome back to the marvellous David Weatherly. David will be our guide as we take a trip to the Peach State in search of Georgia's strange creatures. David, welcome back. Paul, my friend, always good good to talk to you. Yes, likewise, likewise. It's been too long. I know we were just chuckling off air because usually we, we tend to speak fairly regularly every three months or so, which may not seem that regular, but when it's a transatlantic conversation, I think that's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it's been a crazy year, but busy, and it's it's all good. Yeah, absolutely. And this wonderful collection of state series that you've embarked upon has has taken us to Georgia in one of your most recent releases, which is always as fascinating for me as as most readers, I would suspect, because I think once again Georgia is one of those states that. When you look at it on face value, David, it doesn't seem the strangest of states. And yet, once you peel back the layers, there's a lot more going on in this state than perhaps a lot of others. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's it's a fairly large state. Of course, it's one of those places that, again, many of these states that I've addressed so far, you know, people tend to think of them in a, a sort of narrow bandwidth. You know, I, I remember when... Uh, the first one, Silver State Monsters, came out. You know, most people who think about the state of Nevada, they think about Las Vegas, and that's it. Uh, if they think much beyond that, you know, there's a couple of other things, maybe Reno or, or Area 51, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but people, unless they've spent a lot of time in the state, you know, they tend to have a, a fairly – limited view in a way and and of course with georgia you know you say georgia and everybody thinks of atlanta if they know a little bit more they think about uh, savannah which is a coastal city but mm. uh you know beyond that uh, unless you've spent a lot of time in the state or or some time at least investigating and, and researching you know you maybe don't realize uh, georgia is a very large state it has a very diverse ranges from some coastline down in the southern portion of the state all the way up to beautiful mountains in the northern portion and uh, lots in between and many many cryptid legends yeah i think georgia as a as a state is one of those where i've over the the course of doing this show david i've become to really appreciate its weird and wonderful history because as we've mentioned before obviously what i knew about cryptozoology and cryptids 10 years ago is is completely 
irrelevant these days. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Georgia is one of those states that I didn't realize just how much was going on in there. Um, and I think one of the first things that ever came to my attention about the state is one of my favorite real encounters, if you can class it as such, which is this incredible story back at the turn of the 21st century where a gentleman had claimed to have shot this enormous hog, which became known unoriginally, David, as most giant creatures tend to these days, as Hogzilla. <laughs> yeah, Hogzilla. Yeah, that's that's something, you know, in the United States, uh, especially in recent years, there has been uh, a continually growing issue with these giant feral hogs. And um, there was a, a story that broke in, oh, let's see, 2004 uh, about a, a massive hog dubbed Hogzilla by the news, uh, as you stated, uh, that was purportedly somewhere around a thousand pounds. And uh, this gentleman had had shot it in Georgia. Now, the whole story was that uh, he was he was out on a uh, hunting preserve. This is a place in um, uh, called, um, oh, gosh, uh, Holly, uh, Holy Oak. Mm. And it was a plantation. This guy had a, a fish and hunting reserve. Um, and I'm remembering this wrong. River Oak Plantation was uh, this place that, uh, you know, people would come and hunt and, and fish and so forth. And they had these feral hogs that were running the property. Now, this gentleman, uh, he was out one day and, and saw this creature that he claimed was just massive. And uh, the fellow who shot it, he was a, a hunting guy. So he had some familiarity with the you know, with the creatures that were on the property and everything. And he thought this thing was posed a danger. Now, I should point out that they are indeed very dangerous animals. Uh, a lot of a lot of farmers and such consider them a nuisance because these these hogs, these wild hogs will come through and they'll just tear up fields. They'll eat the crops. Uh, they will they'll, they'll run people down. You know, I know a lot of people think, well, come on, a pig can't be dangerous. But, uh, mm. you know, we're talking about massive creatures. Uh, they, they get very large in size. They're very aggressive. And uh, Griffin spotted this thing and decided to shoot it. So he he brought it down. And uh, the uh, holly oak that I mentioned was actually the owner of this reserve. And um, they ended up burying this hogzilla mm. but the story got out and there was a photograph that circulated uh the photograph unfortunately is not in the book i, I had contacted the the fellows i never heard back from them uh there was a whole controversy because they were <laughs> i guess they thought they had a fortune you know in yes. the photograph or something and they were you know going after people who use the photograph without permission and wanting to charge a big fee just to show this photograph and i thought well you know what it's not that impressive it's interesting <laughs> but, uh, but it's a picture of this this massive feral hog that's being lifted up by a crane and griffin the guy who shot it you know standing next to it so the photograph circulated and they talked about the size of this thing and uh slow news week i guess you know the the media got a hold of it they dubbed it hogzilla and there was all this talk about this record-setting hog and eventually uh national geographic got involved the whole thing was uh, a big production to dig this creature up and uh determine you know if it truly was a, a world record-setting creature and so forth mm. and uh they did and they determined that the the hog was not as big as as it was initially claimed to be and and uh no world record uh was set but you know the the whole furor over this thing of course it, as you stated it was a, a real creature uh of known origin of course but of massive proportion and uh since that time actually there have been other record setting feral hogs that have been taken down i i think the record and I'm not positive, but I think it does stand somewhere over a thousand pounds. I think it's something like 1,100 pounds unofficially or something. Mm. Uh, so these these creatures do get very very large, and uh, the whole Hogzilla story it got a lot of news coverage, and they ended up even locally having a, a Hogzilla festival for a yeah. short time. And <laughs> uh, you know, it never seemed to take off. They they abandoned it apparently, but uh, you know, so it's. It's not competing with the Mothman Festival, but, <laughs> you know, for a brief 
brief period of time, Hogzilla was kind of king, I guess you would say. <laughs> yes, I must admit, I found that bit about the, the whole festival a little bit peculiar, <laughs> to be honest, with uh, with your description of the kids all dressed up as little pigs and things running about in the street. Oh, yeah, and they, caught, they, they crowned a, I forget what they called her, like a hog princess or a hog <laughs> queen or something. And yeah. Then, yeah, it's just a very, uh, very bizarre thing. I, I think... You know, it's one of those situations where the the media caught a hold of it, and I guess somebody in the community decided, hey, we can maybe, you know, get some attention for the town or make some money out of this or something. But, mm. uh, yeah, ne- never caught on the way some of the other festivals do. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it is a terrifying creature regardless, and it, it, it's one of those that's it, it's got little weird things about it. Like, I think when they did the DNA testing, it was proven to be a hybrid. So it was, I think they were trying to say that feral hogs had been breaking into normal pig pens or, or something, David, because I remember seeing the original documentary about National Geographic and, and I'm absolutely positive. I've not been able to verify this, but I'm positive that they were claiming that one of the reasons that the hogs in this area were seemingly getting so large is that there's a salmon fishery or something in the area and they're fed sort of steroid induced food that basically just full of protein and these hogs have been breaking into that but i've never been able to find that anecdote about that at all so i may be completely misremembering it well there's there's a lot of theories as to why these things are growing so large uh part of it is uh just the amount of food that they can freely consume because uh they'll they have such a diverse diet and Mm. Uh, what's happened, you know, I, I've encountered feral hogs myself. I can tell you when I was very young and we might have spoken about this on the North Carolina episode, but, yeah. uh, the dismal swamp, which I used to explore a lot when I was younger, uh, it, it had feral pigs and these things, you know, they were very dangerous. I mean, they would run in, uh, groups and, you know, you'd, you'd hear this pack of these wild hogs coming through and, uh, the only thing you could really do was climb a tree and hope that they decided to leave you alone. And, and, you know, there were several times I can remember getting up a tree and just watching these things stampede through, mm. uh, tearing up anything that was in the way. And a lot of times this is a, a combination of, uh, wild pigs, hogs that have gotten loose from farms. Hmm. And have gone off into the wild, you know, gotten away over the years. And uh, there's also a theory that's floated around that they are part of their DNA is from, I think, a Russian boar that was imported at some point into the States for hunting. So Mm -hmm. there's all these different theories about, you know, wild boar that were brought over and crossbred with domestic pigs and uh, the hybrid becomes much larger and, of course, much more aggressive. Mm. And uh, again, the the free reign to to food and high levels of of protein and fat and so forth, you know, makes them grow much larger. And and they seem to be getting larger consistently. I know Texas has a real problem with yeah. them, uh, with how many there are. And uh, you know, you can see you can easily go on and search online at some of the hunting forums and stuff about these things and you know see photographs of these guys that have just taken down these massive massive animals yeah i think that's the problem like you said at the beginning david people go oh well it's just a pig but the thing about these guys is is that they're fast they're aggressive and they will attack you they don't care they don't give a damn they will just go for you that's right yeah yeah and they they'll they'll trample you mm yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Texas because whenever I speak to a Texan, if you mention hogs, they just they'll <laughs> they can go on for ages about just how much of a problem it is out there, David. Yes, yes, lots lots of crops lost to them and and so forth. Yeah, well, no doubt we will continue to hear these these large creatures getting taken down, David. And like you say, unfortunately, th- these are creatures where there is a real problem in in some certain states that they are essentially just becoming an invasive species. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, they're kind of like in the U.S., we have several species that seem to thrive just about anywhere in any environment. Mm. Uh, these wild hogs are one. Uh, we also have, you know, in a lot of places, a problem with coyotes, which have just spread everywhere. Yeah. At this point, coast to coast. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of those things that most people, when you talk about things, problem species, most people don't consider coyotes to be that. But they have. Do you think that's because we've got this? 
thing going on with them as well about crossbreeding with wolves as well, David, that that's made them a bit more resilient. I, I think that's part of it. I think there's also, you know, uh, coyotes are highly adaptable species mm. and uh, they have learned, they're very intelligent and they have learned uh, to survive just about anywhere. So they've, they've moved into suburbs. They've moved into cities. I, I mean, you'll see these eerie pictures. I, I saw one that someone sent me a while back of a coyote on a street, a city street in New York oh. in the middle of the night. And, you know, the thing is, is that they they travel mainly in packs. And often if you see one, he's just kind of a point for the for the pack. And, you know, in rural areas, I mean, they they attack people's pets. And, you know, there's a lot of people who have lost their dogs and their cats and, and animals to these packs of coyotes hmm. uh, because they don't realize how dangerous these things are. And, uh, you know, you just um, you just have to realize it doesn't matter if you live in the city or not. These these creatures are finding ways to adapt and survive. And because of development in recent years, you know, they've lost a lot of their original hunting ground or territory. And uh, because the other wildlife, of course, get, gets moved out, too, they had to find other sources of food. So. Uh, they go after whatever they can find, whether that's a domestic animal or, or whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. And they're a pack animal, so they, you know, they will go for anything as a group, won't they? That's right. Yeah. And another very aggressive animal. Mm, yeah. Well, I think enough of these terrifying domestic creatures on land, David, I think we'd, we'd be best off going out into the water and having a look out <laughs> there and seeing what we've got. And Georgia has one of my favorite water-based cryptids which is the the delightfully named Alti. And I've always liked Alti, primarily for me, David. I don't know what you may think, but I think that the thing about Alti that separates it from quite a lot of alleged water creatures in the States is that where Alti is, is a very well-known area for the locals. They know the water like the back of their hand. This is a community of Darien, I think the main area is where Alti tends to hang about, that... It's it's a it's a water community. They are at one with everything around them. That's correct. Yeah, it's a, it's a town right on the river. And it's pretty fascinating things about this legend. Uh, Alti, incidentally, did get the cover spot for the Georgia book. <laughs> and, uh, you know, great, great uh, creature, I think, to represent uh, Georgia's monsters. Uh, he, he's often seen as being a little bit more on the on the friendly side because of, uh, you know, some of the ways that he's been promoted over the years. Yes. <laughs> uh, but there's some really interesting things about this place. I, I've been to Darien a few times and it's a quiet little community. Uh, when I dug into the history of the the area, one of the things I was really intrigued by was the fact that originally the town was founded by. Uh, a bunch of people from Scotland yes. from a little place called Inverness. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, they initially named the town New Inverness before it was later changed to Darien. Mm. Uh, and if that Scottish town sounds familiar to you, it well should because it has its own water monster. Um, easily probably the world's most famous water monster, the uh, creature none other than Nessie, a yeah. Loch Ness monster. <laughs> And uh, what happened was initially when the uh, Scots people came and settled uh, what became Darien, uh, they started reporting this water creature uh, described very similar to the Loch Ness Monster, uh, the long neck and the long tail, the humped back. And, you know, I should note at this point that it, it's important to realize Native Americans in the region already had legends of a creature living in the water hmm. in that area. So uh, this is not something that was suddenly created by, you know, the uh, a group of Scotsmen who had dipped into the whiskey a little bit too much, in other words. <laughs> they, um, they knew when they came to the area that there were stories of a water monster. And when they started seeing it, you know, it, it eventually became dubbed Al Alti. Hmm. And... What's interesting about this is that, uh, of course, over the years, uh, newspaper reporters and, uh, you know, took up on the story and a lot of really reliable 
witnesses and townspeople in the area reported seeing this creature uh, all along the river and, and in the marshes around it. One of the things that's fascinating about Darien and, and that area of Georgia in particular is that there are rice fields down there. Mm. Uh, abandoned rice paddies. And it, it's funny because I've told people some, I've told some people that and they've been very shocked and said, well, there's not any rice grown in the United States. And I say, no, that's, you know, rice was heavily cultivated in that region uh, for a long time. And so there are all these abandoned rice paddies. I, I've been down there and it's, uh, it's a very unusual area. You know, you have these thick paddies that of course have Lots of water, you know, marsh grasses and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And you look in this area and you look along the river and uh, you take a boat down and you think, wow, you know, this really is kind of the perfect setting for a water creature like this. Very much so. So a lot of fascinating accounts over the years uh, I've come up regarding this creature. Yeah, I think it's one of those as well. As you say, David, you've obviously got the native tradition that has been around for as long as people have taken notice to what's being said. But also, Alti seems to be one of those that's also had a a newspaper coverage reputation as well, because I think one of the earliest reports you mentioned that, that sort of made its name was Captain Delano, who's one of those wonderful characters that we often come across, who basically knows everything there is to know about the sea or, or being on the water and the, the numerous creatures that one can expect to encounter. And he's one of those people who's absolutely 100% adamant what he saw wasn't a whale or a shark or a gator or a sturgeon. He knew exactly what it wasn't. Yeah, that's that's correct. And he, um, you know, he described it, if I recall correctly, as being he thought it was somewhere around 70 feet long, which is just, of course, massive. Yes. But that particular account, that was from the early 1800s. And, you know, it it sort of was the first that I, I guess kind of publicly brought it into the modern era, so to speak, even though that's that's very long ago mm. uh, prior to that. What's interesting is I, I think this may be a situation, too, where we're dealing with multiple creatures, perhaps, that have been hmm. identified as Alti. Because prior to that, you know, there were legends in the area from the uh, Tama tribe that described what they essentially said was a giant snake or serpent that lived in the water. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking at something like that, it's maybe a bit more conceivable that we're talking about a massive length for uh you know, some kind of water serpent or something perhaps that's now extinct. Uh, but then, yes, uh, the good captain comes along in the early 1800s and he reports seeing this thing. And he was he was very insistent that it was not a, a whale, has some suggested or or anything known or, or you know, a, a group of dolphins or anything like that. He was very insistent that he saw the creature clearly and that it was some kind of a water monster that he had never seen in all of his years of seafaring. Yeah. I mean, there are several of these witnesses in Alti's history, David, who are extremely experienced fishermen or people that are, are used to using boats or whatever. They're, you know, they're, they are extremely comfortable being on the water. Ralph DeWitt is another one. And I think you mentioned the townspeople reckon he used to spend 200 days a year on the river yeah which is which is remarkable yeah the wit the wit's uh he's a great witness because he's a, a veteran crab fisherman at that point when he sees the creature and uh he had oh i can't remember i think he had fished in that area for something around 15 years 14 15 years something like that yeah and yeah they they suppose that he spent at least 200 days a year on the water and that's you know that's uh that's someone who's going to be very familiar with what they're seeing in the water. You know, if it, if it's someone, you know, a lot of these reports of people spotting things in the water, uh, they come from the casual weekend boater or, you know, who gets out maybe a few times a year or something like that. And you can kind of say, OK, well, you know, he he probably did see something like a sturgeon or, you know, something like that because he's not that familiar with the various creatures. And, and he certainly wouldn't be familiar with something unusual. Mm. But here we have a guy in DeWitt who, you know, <laughs> spends so many days on the water and makes his living from being on the water uh, that he's well familiar and uh, comfortable 
with the creatures that he encounters and he sees something that um you know he can't uh he can't quite explain either yeah. and his account his account came from uh, the late 80s uh, the Darien news which covered the the sightings of the creature pretty extensively chronicled DeWitt's sighting and uh he said that it was a uh, you know it was a large creature and and that it had a, a blackish brown color and uh, he watched it. He watched it arch up out of the water and, and said that it was somewhere close to 20 feet in length. Yeah. So an, an impressive encounter for sure. Yeah. I mean, there are some very striking encounters in this vicinity. The Manning, is it the Manning brothers? I mean, this is one of those moments which I think a lot of people would hark back to a scene out of Jaws or something, David, where they end up catching something that perhaps they wish they hadn't yeah but you know the thing is is like i said i think you know we look at these accounts collectively and uh it it seems to indicate that we're talking about multiple creatures in Mm. the water down there now you have to bear in mind that you know we're looking at a, a river and this sort of marshland area and you know this is this is southern Georgia. It's very conceivable, I think, in some cases that, you know, there are likely some invasive species that have made their way up that far. I know a lot of people would argue that. Mm. Uh, but Florida has a massive problem with invasive species. You know, things like pythons and uh, anacondas have made their way into the Everglades. And, you know, over time, they have begun to spread uh, north, you know, yeah. because they're expanding their territory. So, you know, I, I think in some cases these people are describing something that is much more, much, much more serpent like or snake like, uh, maybe some kind of a giant eel, hmm. you know, or, or something else. And in other cases, it seems that they're seeing something that really just by all accounts kind of shouldn't exist. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think when you're dealing with a community who are very comfortable with their locality and their fishing history and and the people that come across this creature. Because like you say, a lot of these witness reports in this particular area are locals. And what I found quite striking in the section of the book when you're covering this is that despite this long history of sightings and the quality of the witnesses, David, there's still this kind of reticence to come forward because a lot there is a considerable number of people who just think it's all nonsense as well oh sure because you know even though these kind of topics they become more and more acceptable over time you know with each passing year really uh there is still a large contingent of people that um sort of set parameters around these things right you know it's like when we get to uh, of course if we talk about bigfoot you know a lot of people say well you know, it's I don't mind talking about it because it's on television all the time and other people are talking about it. But there's still other people that say, well, that's kind of that's a crackpot theory. You know, there's a giant uh, hairy creature living in, in the woods. And the same is true for these other uh, monsters, so to speak. So, you know, we have a situation here where in the local community, of course, algae had become sort of a, a known, you know, monster, the hairiest creature. Uh, and this. This cryptid is unexplained that a lot of people think, no, no, you know, people just don't know what they're seeing or they're seeing, you know, fish or a log or, or something normal. And that's it's crazy to think that some unknown species lives in there. Uh, so you get that and you get a combination of that reluctance and then also people worried about their. Oh, what would you call it? You know, I guess their, their place in society, you know, how yeah. they're viewed, their reputation, whether that's because of their, their employment or, uh, just their concern over social standards or, or whatever the case. Uh, people get very worried sometimes about what people, what other people will think rather than just saying, Hey, you know what? This is what happened to me. This is what I saw. Yeah. Well, I think the next witness that fits that parameter perfectly is, Scotty Rogers, who was the former mayor of the area, who in December '92, I think, was he was he driving across a bridge? His and his sighting is rather remarkable because he claimed that he saw something really come out of the water, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And uh, so, so Rogers, as you stated, he was a former mayor of Darien, and he didn't. Um, 
see, it was not, I think it was 93 uh, that the story ran, but he had actually, it, it was a month prior that he had his sighting. So it was just before Christmas in uh, 92. And Scotty Rogers, he was, he was driving across the, the Champney River Bridge and he saw this creature and uh, he said, it was a very good description as you would expect from someone who's, you know, I, I guess um, used to speaking publicly or so forth. So he, he told the reporter that uh, as he was driving over the, br- over the bridge, he saw in the water, uh, a spot in the water that it looked like it was boiling as he described it. And, that turmoil he took at first to be, oh, it's probably a school of fish all gathered around. If anybody's ever seen a school of fish gathered near the surface, it does sort of make that kind of phenomena, you know, where the water is all choppy and in in a concentrated area. It does look like it could be boiling or something. Hmm. Uh, but Rogers, he he watches this for a moment, and he said that uh, what he saw looked like a he took to be a big inner tube, as he described it, uh, coming out of the water. And, of course, in short order, he realizes that this is actually a creature that is rising up out of the water. He says it came up, um, I think he says somewhere around eight or nine feet out of the water. Yeah. And that has he, he watched it. Uh, he described it as being as, as broad as the size of a car. Hmm. And uh, estimated that he was looking at something somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty feet long. So one of one of my fa- that and the the uh, Dewitt sighting, I think, are just hands down kind of the best two. Uh, and there are a lot of good sightings of Aussie, but you know those two alone, I think they I think they carry a lot of weight because uh, in Dewitt you have. As we spoke about a, a veteran fisherman who's very familiar with the aquatic life in the area. And then with Rogers, you've got someone who, even though he is the former mayor, he still has sort of a reputation, right? He's a respected mm. community figure. So he's not going to lightly come out with something like this, uh, you know, just, just on a lark or, or if he thinks he's mistaken. Yeah. Uh, so it, it makes for a, a pair of very impressive sightings. Yeah. There's also a number of people who've, who've encountered Alti more than once, which I find gives them more credence as well, David. It seems that these people who are regularly out on the water are, they're not getting, seeing it every year, but they do seem to have fairly regular, I mean, if you're going to see a, a monster, seeing it once is remarkable, but when you when you see it more than once, I suppose that really does challenge everything you think of, because you must think it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And then three or four years later, you run into it again. Yeah, I know. It's pretty impressive, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and one of the other things that I remember really well about Alti is Alti has obviously been involved in a very notorious modern hoax as well, which is one of those things that over the last few years, more and more of these things, especially when we've got, YouTube and and video on demand these days, David, a lot of people are very quick to kind of pretend, you know, it's not just Bigfoot that people like to hoax. Um, And there was a gentleman, I think he was called Jeff Warren, who claimed to have stumbled across the corpse of of an unknown creature. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, you know, for some reason, Georgia has been plagued with some, (laughs) some, uh, pretty big hoaxes you know i I guess you would say and uh i don't know that that's necessarily a good thing but uh this character yeah he claimed that he had discovered the corpse of uh, what he believed was alti washed up and when they uh he took some photographs and he got a lot of media attention and then of course he uh you know the officials came out to investigate and and discovered well no this is um you know, this is a hoax. And mm-hmm. when they followed up on this character, of course, they found that he wasn't even real. It wasn't even a real name he had had given or anything else. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know, it's it's a sad, sad fact that we as investigators of the unknown have to deal with this kind of nonsense because, um, you know, anytime you hear something like this, you think initially, wow, you know, maybe this is actually something. 
Uh, but then, you know, when you learn that it's, oh, it's a corpse of something else or it's been in this case, I think he had used you know, like paper mache and, and some various things to create some kind of a creature and, you know, took these pictures. And, you know, I, I don't know why these characters do this. I, I mean, in this case, I think he was just uh, someone who probably considered himself very funny, you know, a prankster that. Mm. would get a lot of media attention or, or whatever because uh, there didn't seem to be anything in terms of, of seeking money or anything like that for the evidence has uh, has another famous Georgia hoax did. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, in this case, this guy, um, he just vanished and the thing quickly went away, fortunately. Yeah. I am surprised as well. I know you mentioned her name a few times in this particular section, uh, which was, was Ann, Ann Davis. David, was she mm-hmm. a journalist? Yeah, she wrote for the newspaper, for the Daring News. And um, she uh, she kind of took it upon herself to collect a lot of the Alti sightings and, um, you know, did a pretty good job with chronicling the sort of evolution in modern times of the, the sightings. And, of course, she was a local, so she was very connected into all these people and, and, you know, knew a good portion of them who reported sightings of the creature. Yeah, and it's a shame because I, I think you mentioned that she created an online resource, but unfortunately that's not available anymore. Yeah, it's been taken down. Taken down. She um, she passed away, and uh, I don't know. I, I guess there was just no one left to to maintain it or anything. Uh, but when it was up back in the day, it was sort of a, a kind of a timeline of a lot of the sightings, and uh, very much in a news type of fashion i i guess you know sort of factual this is the you know the date and the time and and so forth so uh she would detail all of those things and she was the point person i i don't think there's anybody now although i know that if you if you ever make a trek to darien which is is kind of a cool trip uh and you go to the visitor center in town they really do very much honor the their local cryptid because uh, Alti is on the visitor sign. Uh, but even more impressive, when you walk into the visitor center, there is this massive sculpture mm. that has been done uh, of Alti. I, I have some photographs of it in the book that I took. And uh, it's just a really cool looking representation of the sea creature and uh, or the water creature. And it was it was based on all the various accounts uh, that people have reported of of Darien's river monster, and um, you know the uh, the sculpture is is very realistic. It's very lifelike. Yeah, it is, and it's. I think one of the other striking aspects of the book that makes me think about things a bit more in the world of cryptozoology, David, is you've got a section about skunk apes, and then you've mm-hmm. got a, a much cons- a considerably larger section on Bigfoot. And I suppose some people would think, well, they're one and the same, aren't they? But obviously, for a lot of people, the skunk apes are very different to what we would consider Bigfoot. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, a lot of times these books, they're, they're sort of organic as they developed and uh, develop. And in this case, uh, it was written that way because uh, I sort of segue from uh, skunk apes and, and wild men right into some of the other uh, legends of hairy bipeds in the state. And of course I cover Bigfoot through the decades in Georgia as I've done with each of these books, you know, I go sort of decade by decade for the modern times. Uh, but in Georgia, you know, there's, there's some legends. First of all, there's a very large swamp in Georgia, the Okefenokee. And you have a, a story that circulated a lot in recent times about a purported battle that took place deep in the swamp. Yes. Uh, with this giant. And it's, it's one of those accounts that, uh, you know, <laughs> if you look at it and, and really try to follow up on the, any possible historic notes, you fairly quickly come to the conclusion that, well, sadly, this is probably one of the classic, um, creative, accounts of the day so to speak <laughs> <laughs> you know um and it it involves a uh, it, it starts off with a uh, couple of people a, a gentleman and a, a young boy who are trekking in the swamp and they find these massive footprints and 
they head out of the swamp and they report this finding. The the preface preface sort of to this is that the swamp already had a legend for being the home of these mysterious giants. There was native lore involving a an island in the middle of the swamp that was supposed to be the domain of these uh, beautiful kind of mystical women and their husbands who were uh, these fierce warrior giants. Mm. Um, there's some some native lore about a hunting party that was lost and uh, hopelessly lost and found by a group of these women who, who gave them these uh, corn cakes and basically, you know, kind of helped them survive, but said at the same time, you better leave before our husbands return because they're, they're fierce and they'll, they'll kill you all. So we already have this sort of strange lore around the swamp as if swamps aren't weird enough to begin with. Right. Uh, but you know, you get these added legends in and then you get this story that comes along about the find of this massive footprint. And in short order, it's determined that, well, you know, uh, we need to, to track these giants down or this creature or whatever it is. So, uh, the story claims that a, party of hunters from Florida arrived and they trekked deep into the swamp uh, in search of this giant and they ended up in a battle with it. Uh, it it, it, it kind of reads almost like a, a B horror movie when you start yes. <laughs> uh, looking at the original news sources because they claim that, you know, it's just a bit flowery. Of course, they've all, you know, they're settling in to make camp for the evening and, you know, was, they built a fire and all of a sudden then they hear these sounds and this massive creature rushes out and it's, it tears some of the men apart physically, you know, rips their heads off and, and so forth. And, uh, and then you've got a, a gun battle that ensues with the, the, uh, remaining men all firing and, and putting enough shots into this creature to kill it. Yeah. Before they, uh, and, and right afterwards, they, of course, gather their things up and, and rush out of the swamp in fear that there are more of these things deep in there. Mm. So, you know, you have this as an early story about some wild men or giants or something living in, in the swamp. And then if you sort of follow that trail through the ages and you go into modern times, you know, you still get reports of strange things in and around the swamp. And uh, one of the things we hear reports about are skunk apes. Hmm. Uh, now, this is this is essentially a regional term for Bigfoot, uh, because when you listen closely to the descriptions, uh, they very much are described in a Bigfoot light figure. Typically with a skunk ape, you'll hear that the creature was, uh, they're usually not as described as being as tall. Uh, so many of the uh, accounts of skunk apes, they'll say, well, it was, you know, six or seven feet tall. So we're still in the range of, uh, you know, a normal human size, you know, maybe, you know, if we're reaching seven feet, of course, we're getting into the basketball player territory. Right. But, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're still talking about a bit more human in that sense. And they're also said to be rather lanky. Mm. Uh, so not as massive in, in the arms and chest, like, uh, for instance, reports from the Pacific Northwest would indicate. So. The term itself, of course, has uh, arisen because of the foul odor that is said to accompany these creatures. And, uh, you know, the reports say that it's just an overpowering stench that smells like something out of the swamp, but also something, you know, decaying or rotting and so forth. And, you know, they're often uh, cited, of course, around in and around the swamp. And hence, we have this whole term skunk ape that has arisen over the years. Yeah, I think there are some of these early stories that I love. The the Beale story, David, I just find that one fabulous. It's one of my favorite stories I've ever read in regards to some of these early reports. And that's this crazy situation where we've got what they claim is a bear that builds a pig pen. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, those... You know what's odd, too, Paul, is that I have found a couple of those accounts uh, where, you know, these these creatures... Um, 
in this particular case, the one you're talking about was, um, again, deep in the swamp where they discovered uh, all of these pieces of a fence that had gone missing. Yeah. And very carefully selected because it was only the fence pieces that were nice and sturdy. Uh, didn't have any, any rod or, or splintering or anything else to them. Uh, so all these fence pieces that had disappeared and, uh, this gentleman, you know, he got a group of people together and they trekked deep into the, the swamp and they found deep in the swamp on a, on a mound so that it was dry. So on a, on a high area that was, was nice and dry, uh, a, a pen had been built and filled with pigs and, uh, they found these tracks all around the pen that they described as looking like something, something akin to massive bear tracks. Now, a bear is not going to build a pig pen. <laughs> you know, it's just not going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> this is, this is a very strange case. I think it's particularly fascinating because it's not, it's also not overly dramatic. You know, we're not, we're not getting an account of a, you know, a, a a life and death battle with a massive creature or anything like that. We're getting a, a very strange mystery that really wasn't solved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I know some people say, oh, well, it, obviously it was Bigfoot, but I've never come across a similar Bigfoot story, David. You may have done, but I've certainly never come across one where Bigfoot's been claimed to have built a pen for all the pigs he's been stealing. Yeah, there's there's one other account that I came across that's kind of similar about a um, uh, a number of pigs that had gone missing and were found in a, a a remote pen that had been stuck up. But um, but this one is pretty unique because it's, it was well documented and mm. you know I, I just gosh to be able to you know see photographs or something of those tracks at the very least. Uh, yeah. But of course, sadly, we we don't have that. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, you know, the gentleman he. He took all his pigs uh, back and got out of the swamp with them and, and promptly went and sold them at market so that he didn't have to deal with, uh, <laughs> you know, these strange thefts anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think the one thing, like I say, when I'm reading that story is the fact that everyone goes, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a bear. This bear's built this. And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's it's so bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> well, there's a couple of wonderful stories like that. The other one I really like from... Uh, from a fair bit ago is the conference sisters uh and they're wonderfully they ended up calling it the conference booger um which is the one that ends up running underneath their house and starts screaming and banging their floorboards and it yeah. gives these two ladies a real fright <laughs> yeah yeah and which uh you know the the whole the booger term we get uh we get with them we get it with in uh the chapter on the belt road booger yeah. And, uh, this is another, this is another distinctly southern term, uh, that you hear applied to these hairy creatures. And, uh, you find it in more than just Georgia. You find it in various places in the south. I, I've heard it in, in North Carolina and, uh, Tennessee and, and some other places. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, again, sort of, uh, a regional description of these hairy giants. And uh, often when you hear somebody talking about a booger, it seems to be attached to stories that are a bit more, oh, what term would I, I use that's uh, <laughs> that's safer on air? You know, they're just kind of a, annoying characters. Uh, <laughs> they, they seem to be uh, just troubling, you know, beasts. I, I've heard old moonshiners talk about there being uh, a, a booger in their yeah. region who would come and mess with their still you know so would come in and tear things up and yeah the belt road booger which is is covered in the book is one that numerous people saw and just felt kind of harassed by it i guess you would say <laughs> yeah they do send, tend to be a little bit more mischievous than our, our typical bigfoot or skunk ape creatures mm -hmm. david yeah. for whatever reason that you know they're always banging on windows or, or scaring people when they're in the toilet or something that's right <laughs> Um, and like you say, we were touching on when we were talking about hoaxes. I think because the thing about Georgia and Bigfoot is there are two polar opposites of the whole phenomenon here for me, because you've got one of the best and most interesting reports, which is what happened at Elkins Creek. But mm -hmm. I think before we get there, I think we need to deal with the elephant in the room in regards to hoaxes. And I remember this. 
um, at the turn of the noughties, David, which is this yeah. this body hoax. And the, we the, all remember this. <laughs> oh, and I remember it more because of the people involved. I mean, one of them was a serving police officer, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, infamous Georgia Bigfoot body. <laughs> and uh, if, you know, for those who weren't around uh, studying the, the field or whatever or didn't have an interest at the time, uh, we're going back to 2008. And uh, this, Paul, this made national news, uh, international mm-hmm. news. I, I'm sure you guys heard about it a lot over there, too, because yeah. it was on all the, the major news networks. So uh, summer of 2008, uh, story breaks that two men in Georgia have the body of a Bigfoot. Now, some people, you know, in recent years, there's been a whole controversy, you know, the kill, no kill argument and so forth. So, you know, back then you didn't really hear much about that. And in 2008, this was kind of the the holy grail in a way in terms of cryptozoology. It's like, oh, my gosh, you know how we have an actual body, you know, so now we're going to prove the creature exists, so on and so forth, or, you know. Mm. We're going to make great advancements. But there were a few problems, even from the get go, because uh, one of the figures involved, there were two men. uh, One of the figures is a gentleman named Rick Dyer. Mm. And uh, (laughs) Dyer, he uh, a lot of people considered him a questionable character. I'm going to be very careful with how I talk about this. (laughs) Yes. uh, Honestly. uh, And, you know, I'm I'm careful in the book on how I talk about it. I will say for those interested, Lauren Coleman, uh, my friend and the, and the head of the International Cryptozoology Museum, wrote just a, an outstanding timeline of the whole Georgia Bigfoot body episode. And it's still available online the last I checked. Uh, if you just Google his name and, and the Georgia Bigfoot body, you'll find this and you can go through and, and read it. It's pretty, pretty detailed. Uh, but back to the story. So one of the gentlemen was uh, Rick Dyer, who a lot of people were suspicious right away uh, yeah. that something was amiss. And uh, that was sort of count- counterbalanced in a way uh, by the other man who was involved. It was a gentleman named Matthew Witten, hmm. who was indeed a, a police officer. So, you know, I remember as this was all unfolding and people were saying there's there's no way a police officer is involved in in a hoax. You know, it just wouldn't happen. So the pair come out. They say they've got this Bigfoot corpse that they had recovered. Uh, They've got it in a freezer (laughs) and, uh, you know, they're they're ready to make a deal, so to speak. So. More and more details about the story come out, and um, it builds into this whole thing that, you know, honestly, Paul, uh, P.T. Barnum would have been proud of (laughs) of the entire affair as it unfolded because we had every media outlet from local news all the way up to, you know, CNN and Fox News and everything was covering this. There were reporters everywhere. Uh, you know, it was being covered daily. Witten and Dyer were doing press conferences and, and you know, videos and, and all these different things were coming out. In the midst of it, uh, an anonymous, wealthy person started working on a deal to purchase the body. Mm. And um, I'm, I'm very familiar with this because I, I'm, I know a couple of the people who were involved has in betweens during the purchase and in the, uh, in the midst of the Fuhrer, uh, none other than Tom Biscardi got involved. And anybody who's studied the Bigfoot field much, uh, you've probably run across Biscardi who is, considered by some people another questionable character because he's um you know the sort of uh two sides to him he's very good at getting the media attention he calls himself quote the real bigfoot hunter Mm -hmm. and uh whenever something big like this comes along biscardi seems to be kind of there front and center and uh he got involved brokering this deal uh, between Dyer and Witten and this uh, wealthy person who wanted to purchase the body. So, you know, the the long and short of the story is that um, eventually a deal was made. The body was purchased. Uh, it was in a freezer, which was uh, picked up 
and shipped to the Midwest. And, uh, it, it was completely frozen solid, of course. So they, you know, they had to start thawing this thing out. And as soon as they did, of course, the, the first part of it that comes out of, uh, deep freeze is shown to be rubber. Yes. And it's a, it's a suit of some kind, which has been filled with animal parts. And, uh, you know, the whole thing literally does fall apart in terms of, <laughs> of the story and, and everything else. And, uh, you know, lots of other crazy things wound up in the midst of all of this. Of course, there were lawsuits. You know, there were people who were, were suing for fraud. The wealthy, uh, this gentleman, he wanted his money back, you know, um, <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it's, it's kind of, it, it could almost be a movie, you know, it's just so insane, the, the stuff that happens. And the funny thing is, is that even in the aftermath of this, you know, at, at one point much later on, the, the Bigfoot suit that was used for the hoax went up for auction. Yes. <laughs> I was really amused at this whole thing as it played out because, the suit was put up for auction and it is sold for on eBay for some outrageous sum. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was, but it was some crazy amount of money that the, the suit was auctioned for. And then it turned out that most of the bids on the suit were phony. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've got, you know, we've got hoaxed bids for a, a hoaxed, uh, Bigfoot, you know, it's just the absurdity of it. It's just so <laughs> strange. And, and of course, uh, in the aftermath of it, the, the suit itself seems to have disappeared. Yes. Uh, now I, I've, I've been told, uh, privately that it's, it's, someone believes it's still in, in the possession of the, the gentleman who purchased the, the quote Bigfoot body initially and that it's uh, still in the Midwest. But uh, what a, what a crazy, crazy story. Absolutely. Well, it does seem that everybody gets involved. I know you were on about people saying that they wanted everybody prosecuting for fraud. Cause I know Matt Moneymaker got a real bee in his bonnet about the whole thing, didn't he? He really did. Uh, um, in particular because of Biscardi being involved and, and I, you know, I guess that uh, I don't know if there's something personal there or what the story is, or maybe it's just, you know, Matt took great offense at the whole, the whole episode getting so much media attention for, you know, for something that was completely phony, you know, something bogus. Yeah. But yeah, Matt was really pushing for, for, for legal proceedings against Biscardi and everyone else that was involved in the hoax. And uh, you would kind of think in some ways that, you know, maybe that should be done because of how much, media attention alone and how much, uh, you know, was wrapped up in the whole situation, but it all just seemed to, to kind of go away and, and fizzle out. Biscardi for his part, now he claimed that he had been quote hoodwinked, uh, in, in the whole affair. And, uh, he even made a, a documentary hmm. about the whole thing and, and sort of showing his side and claiming that no, he had been as much a victim as everyone else. And, uh, you know, this is one of those stories where I think that if you have the interest in it, you kind of have to read all the information and the documents yourself and make your own decision what you think uh, yeah. about, you know, who did what <laughs> wrong. Uh, but, of course, the sad thing is, is that, you know, it, it was completely phony. And for those of us with a vested interest in the field, you know, you, during the time, you know, it was – was quite aggravating to find out that, gosh, you know, here's, we've gotten all this media attention. We've gotten all of this, uh, publicity about Bigfoot and it's all because of a, a complete hoax, uh, rather than something that's, you know, more significant or, or important. Well, I think the ramifications are obviously far more than the original perpetrators imagined because Whitten lost his job over it, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did. And, uh, you know, it's just, <sighs> You kind of look at this and, and when you read all of the, when you read through everything, you kind of, um, you sort of scratch your head and wonder, you know, what, what exactly did these guys think? You know, what, yeah, <laughs> what did they think was going to happen? I, I mean, you know, where, where's the, I, I, I'm just, I, I can't wrap my head around how this developed in their minds. Yeah. You know, how they thought it was going to play out. Uh, in other words, you know, 
what were they suspecting was going to occur? Did they believe that they would get, you know, a million dollars for this body and that whoever bought it would just keep it in a block of ice or something and never, I mean, it's just very strange, you know, that, um, there was no consideration as to what the actual end game was to this. Yeah. So yeah, strange, strange story. Yeah. I must admit when I looked at it, David, I agree. I, I can't really understand where they thought this was going to end up because Maybe it started off as a joke that just ran out of control, but then they kept throwing fuel on the fire and making, yeah, it, making it worse and worse and worse. And then I think they were basically stuck in a in a position where they just had to go along with it and be damned of the consequences. Sadly, yeah. At one point, you know, they they did a they did a video on uh, was a YouTube that you know purportedly had the scientist <laughs> in it and. Uh, you know, of course, it, it turns out that the scientist is none other than uh, one of Witten's relatives or something. And, and then, <laughs> you know, that's question. And they said, well, you know, we were just uh, we were just trying to give everyone something to, you know, to to keep their focus while the DNA is being worked on or, or whatnot. You know, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, and there were all these, uh, of course, talks about, you know, oh, well, DNA tests are being done and, you know, this. Here's this, you know, here's this scientist who's, you know, going to talk to you about the ramifications of the DNA and so forth. And, uh, you know, they it, it's quickly uncovered, you know, that, oh, this is not not even a real scientist. You know, this is and uh, the response was, well, you know, we thought give you something to do for the weekend. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's just. Yeah, it's just one of those things. You you wonder what the end game, you know, if there even was a plan. Maybe it did just develop, like you say. Maybe it just got out of hand. But um, yeah. certainly, at the very least, goes down as uh, probably the most famous modern hoax uh, yeah. involving Bigfoot. Mm. Definitely, and I think we need to sort of realign our uh, our belief a little bit, then, David, and look at perhaps the complete opposite, as I mentioned before we dove into the. Uh, the whole body hoax, which is the Elkins Creek situation, which was a farmer, I think, in Pike County who, mm -hmm. who kept calling the police saying that something was causing a disturbance on his property. Um, and we have the opposite here. We have a police officer who at first thinks, well, you know, maybe this guy's just going a bit over the top about things and maybe he's just being bothered. But then fair play to this, this guy, Deputy Aiken, I think he was called. He starts to think that perhaps it's just not that simple. And then there's a couple of things that occur and you think, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. So this was, this is a very fascinating find, probably one of the most significant track finds, I think certainly in modern times. Uh, this is, this is a uh, story that goes back to 90, uh, 93 and, uh, involves a gentleman who, you know, he lives in a rural area and, and he's actually considered a nuisance caller by the sheriff's department because, uh, he's, he's constantly ringing in to complain about things happening on his property. And, and this one particular deputy, Deputy Aiken, decides to, uh, look into the situation and find out exactly what's going on. Uh, so he goes out to the gentleman's property and there's, there's, a range of things that are happening. He's having, uh, just dis disruptions on his, on his property. He's, he's got these, uh, sacks of, he's got a sack of dog food at one point that's ripped open and a lot of the dog food is stolen and, and, you know, carted off somehow. And, you know, there's thoughts that, uh, like I said from the sheriff's department that, oh, he's just, you know, he's kind of a crank. He's just, you know, he's just making these, calls but there's really nothing going on Aiken thinks that uh, maybe there are uh, moonshiners or something in the area that are trying to run the guy off his property uh, so he goes out and investigates and uh, makes some makes some time to really look into what's going on mm. and uh, this gentleman tells Aiken that you know there's a uh, this tapping sound uh that has been happening on the phone on the uh home you know that someone's been tapping or, or knocking against the walls of the home at night uh they report uh the gentleman and his wife have both seen this this shadowy humanoid figure around the property at night and uh i think it's a case where this 
this deputy took his job seriously, you know, to, to serve and protect and decided, well, you know, there's something going on with this old guy. And, you know, I want to see if I can figure out what it is, you know, who who's harassing him or whatnot. Yeah. So he uh, he makes several investigations of the property. He doesn't really come up with anything. And, you know, like I said earlier, he he. Aiken himself kind of comes to the conclusion that, well, maybe there's somebody harassing this guy, just trying to get him off the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, of course, the interesting thing comes when Aiken is is sort of scouting around the area and uh, he follows a game trail that leads right up to this gentleman's property and uh, to the farm. And he thinks, well, this might be. This might be what these, you know, moonshiners or whoever it is are, are using to access the, this guy's property. So he follows the area. He, he ends up following it down to a creek and he finds these tracks. Uh, they go into the water and they're massive in size. They're 17 and a half inches mm. in length and uh, eight and a half inches wide. So Aiken ends up uh, casting one. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, bear in mind, this is 93 that he investigated all of this. Uh, he ends up keeping this cast. He just kind of puts it, you know, in the closet or something at home and forgets about it. And uh, he investigated for some time because the initial calls were coming in in 93. And I think he actually made the cast in 94 yeah. uh, when he was on the gentleman's property. So he forgets about it for uh three years and 1997 he ends up talking to a a group of people at a local gun shop and uh he finds out that this guy that he had become friends with was interested in bigfoot and uh this gentleman his name is uh, steve hyde so he was a bigfoot researcher and had become friends with his deputy and in the midst of this conversation aiken says well you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I've got this cast that I made <laughs> several years ago. So it comes out. And uh the cast, of course, is it's made the rounds and the uh, it made the rounds in the aftermath. You know, Jeff Meldrum, Dr. Jeff Meldrum took a look at it and was very impressed by the cast. And uh they sent sent it to uh Chilcut, the fingerprint guy from Texas. Yeah. And uh he was really impressed with it. And it's just is considered one of the best Bigfoot casts that are out there at this point. Yeah. I think there are some really striking incidents, though, on this property as well, David. I mean, this guy's shed door gets completely ripped off and Aiken's like, well, that's not been it's not been crowbarred. It's not been rammed. It's been ripped off its hinges by something. And then you've got this enormous tractor tire that's. 30 foot up a tree that somebody thrown mm-hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah there's and and these are the things that you know <laughs> these uh these calls you know they're like i said they're considered just nuisance calls at first but you know here you have a situation where a police officer uh this deputy really took his his job serious and decided to look into this and he did find he found these weird things you know the the shed was one of the most impressive things because it was had a heavy master lock Mm-hmm. on the hasp and uh he looked everywhere for some evidence of how this thing was pried off and there was nothing yeah there was nothing at all and it was as if it had just been ripped off uh by hand by something uh so it, it was a a mystery that kept Aiken interested enough to keep looking into it and of course you know it, it culminates in him finding these massive tracks yeah, I think fair play to him as well because he was clearly determined to get to the root of it because he started going around in his spare time as well, didn't he? He did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he clearly thought there was a lot more to this than meets the eye. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, uh, and you know, he came up with results really when it comes down to it because he found those tracks. Yeah, and fair play to him. Brilliant. It's a fa- fantastic case and there's some really perplexing details to it that... Uh, Anybody who's not aware of it, I, I recommend you dive into it and have a have a real look at the body of evidence and the the work that this deputy did because it it really does make you scratch your head, David. Absolutely does, and it, it's it's probably it's the most impressive piece of evidence out of Georgia, that's for sure. Hmm. Mm, definitely. Well, I think the last thing I want to touch on, David, 
is a marvellous story, which is probably one of those that's found more notoriety in the modern era. And that is the story involving the werewolf girl of Talbot County. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, yeah. this is one of those that I remember reading several years ago in a book about werewolves and then not really seeing much about it. And then sort of over the last sort of ten, five to ten years, I've seen this story crop up a couple of times. And it's a very interesting case because it kind of, on one level, it kind of looks at like some kind of romantic tale. But we have a historical record of this family and people being sent away. So were you surprised that in George's history, there is this strange tale about an alleged werewolf running around. Right. So uh, like you, Paul, I had, you know, I knew about the story from many, many years previously and uh, had heard a couple of different versions of it, which, of course, when you dig into the historical record, uh, this is one of those things that in the whole cryptozoology lore, if you will, uh, there are certain tales that seem to be quite a blend of, of fact and folklore. And over the years, you know, you get some different variations and versions that come in. Um, and this one certainly does have those elements. And, and on top of it, it also has a, a couple of very odd coincidences I, or synchronicities, I guess you would say. But the the story revolves around a, a young girl named Isabella. And uh, she is the daughter of uh, Mildred Owen Burt. And the Burts, they live in, in Talbot County. So the story has been dubbed the Wolf Girl of Talbot County or the Werewolf of Talbot County. And the story says that uh, this young girl, Isabella, was very unusual looking, uh, that she had very thick, dark, shaggy hair, uh, dense eyebrows, and, you know, just uh, uh, small eyes, un unusual features, yeah. unusual features that were capped off, if you will, by her teeth, which were said to be very pointed mm. and uh, so sharp that it looked like they had been shaped with a, a file. So the story is, is that uh, this girl, she was very reclusive and it's a wealthy family. Uh, so the story is, is that Isabella, you know, she she pretty much spends most of her time in the library reading books that her her father, her parents had brought back from Europe. And this small community, uh, these strange attacks start occurring on uh, domestic animals. These sheep primarily are being attacked and. Uh, it appears to be some kind of a, a wolf kill or something, something unusual attacking these animals because the throats are being ripped out. Mm. So it gets so bad that uh, the farmers are sick of their livestock being attacked. So they get together a group to start uh, hunting at night, trying to track this thing down, whatever it is. Now, they don't know at this point what it is, you know, if it's a, a pack of wolves or, or what. Uh, but purportedly what happens is that Isabella gets up in the middle of the night and she is uh, followed out as she walks out of the house. Uh, she's followed by her sister and then also the mother and that she goes all the way up to a, a pasture where there's some animals and, uh, <laughs> everything kind of coalesces at the same time, right? Because the uh, posse shows up at the same time and they see this figure mm. at the edge of the, the field that looks like it's getting ready to, to leap out at the animals. So they take a shot, uh, purportedly hit this girl in, you know, even in, in the darkness. And then the young girl is rushed back home by her mother uh, who treats her wounds and very, suddenly sends her off to, quote, visit relatives in Europe. <laughs> so reportedly, <laughs> while uh, Isabella is off visiting relatives in Europe, uh, the attacks stop. And, you know, the, the Talbot werewolf has, uh, is done. 
So this legend, I mean, that's kind of the core of the story of what happens. But then you get a lot of other things that have been thrown into the mix because uh, there are various stories that claim that, of course, she was suffering from lycanthropy, that she was a, a werewolf. Yeah. Uh, there's one version of the tale involves a, a uh, an old man in town who tells the posse that they have to gather all the silver in town and melt it down into bullets. And uh, <laughs> I think that's a later edition. It's just very creative you know when you throw yeah. it into the mix but there are some weird things that are involved with the story i mean the the girl the family's real the the characters are real isabella is buried in talbot county she's uh, her grave is on private property yeah and uh they they pretty strictly enforce uh anybody trespassing because of the legend obviously yeah. Uh, there are stories of, of, uh, Isabella, of something being different about her, whether she was suffering from some kind of, a, a physical condition or, or whatever it was. Uh, it's, it's hard to say. It is odd if she, at the least, that if she disappeared and the attacks stopped at the same time, that's, that's a strange synchronicity. Uh, the one that really, kind of grabbed me and and i i thought about this midway through researching it and then i I later saw where someone else had commented on it too uh the fact that it all occurs in talbot county Mm. is a a fascinating synchronicity when we when we consider that universal's wolfman movie uh the character is named larry talbot (laughs) yeah you know so it's sort of the the name game element i guess being thrown into the whole mix which uh, just made it all kind of fascinating. And it is a, it's certainly a curious piece of lore, that's for sure. Yeah, it would not surprise me, David. There's enough strange things, especially in the world of entertainment, where people from certain areas tend to bring a bit of their local lore into the mix. And I wouldn't be surprised if we, if somebody involved in the Wolfman was from Georgia. Yeah, it's very possible. I, I've, uh, I, I've never seen an indication of it, but it, it could be. Or maybe someone who just... Somewhere along the way, heard the legend and, and the name kind of stuck in their mind or something. It's hard to say. But uh, like I said, a very odd synchronicity at the very least. Yeah, very true. It's one of those things that strikes me. It's like the Count from Sesame Street, David. Why is he obsessed with, with counting and he's a vampire? And, and yet, when you look <laughs> when you look at Eastern European tradition, certain areas, their vampires are obsessed with counting. And that's how you escape them. So that wouldn't right. surprise me either. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's a strange thing, but it's a it's a wonderful collection of stories. Once again, there are more and more than we could carry on talking about. There's all kinds of things with giant spiders and giant snakes and more more Bigfoot stories than you can shake a stick at. So if you're not aware of how prevalent the big guy is in Georgia, I recommend it highly for anybody's Bigfoot research, David. So once again, it's it's a brilliant collection of this state's legends and cryptids. So where can everybody get hold of a copy, David, and and keep an eye on your forthcoming work, my friend? Well, the best place to follow my work is eerielights.com, and that is E-E-R-I-E lights.com. You'll find links there for all the books, updates on on events and interviews, and uh, occasionally I'll put articles and so forth up there, uh, as well as the information about various projects I'm involved with. The books are all available on Amazon. Uh, there are uh, several in the States series out already. These Monsters of America, as we're calling it. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the goal is to get through all 50 states. Uh, I know everyone always wants to know when their state, if their state is the next one. Uh, but uh, if you're in the in the U.S. and you're listening and you have some encounter, something that you've experienced somewhere, uh, in the States, feel free to, to send it to me. It might show up in a book. Uh, there's a contact form at eerielights.com. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm have a fantastically busy schedule, so I can't promise that I always get back to people, uh, right away, but, uh, I certainly love to hear your encounters. And, uh, again, eerielights.com, amazon.com for the books and keep an eye out because another one is about to be announced very soon. Excellent. Can't wait for that. And I know for a fact, David, it's not going to be six months till we speak again, my friend. (laughs) So uh, thank you as always for your conversation, your wonderful quality of work. And I look forward to the next time we can talk about another state and its wonderful legends. My pleasure, Paul. Always good to talk with you.